Welcome to Proven Component Patterns. My name is Ben Hong and I'm a VUE core team member and I'll be your instructor for this course. The reason we created this course is because when it comes to creating components and designing them, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And so we wanted to share some of the best practices and methodologies when it comes to doing so. Although when I say that, best practices really should be put in air quotes because this idea of best practices, which is honestly kind of a controversial term within our industry, is this idea that there really is a superior technique or methodology when it comes to writing code a certain way. And the truth is, is that there really are exceptions to every rule. And so as a result, as we're learning about different patterns and techniques, I really want you to take away the why in terms of why this technique or pattern works the way it does and see if it really does make sense for your code base. Rather than arbitrarily applying this to your code base because you're like, oh, well, you know, because the course said this is a pattern, we're gonna use this pattern, making sure that it works well, not only for the code base, but for your team as well, because Really, what a code base ultimately is, is something that a bunch of people are maintaining together. And so the easier you make it for your teammates to not only maintain the code, but then to push out new features, that's really ultimately what we all want out of our code bases, right? And so at the end of the day, what this course is really about is sharing a lot of the proven component patterns and techniques that I've seen across so many different code bases across different industries, and basically sharing them with you so that you can figure out what works best for you and your team. With that said, let's jump right in. The first pattern we want to talk about is really an architectural pattern, and that's this idea around configuration versus composition. So the very first technique that most people come across when they're learning Vue and designing their components is this concept of props. And so don't worry, we're not going to go over what props are. We assume that you already know that in this course. But here we have more or less a standard prop that has been defined according to best practices. We have a label prop that has a type of string as a default value of home, which means you no longer need the required property. It also has a validator to go ahead and do some basically checking as far as like, is this prop valid? All right, so this is pretty good. And so with that in mind, we're gonna jump into a little coding experiment that we're gonna do inside our head. So I don't want you to whip out a code editor or anything, just go ahead and you know close your eyes and we're gonna run through a series of requirements and I want you to try to design the component as quick as you can. Remember, I want you to kind of go with your gut on this one. All right, first thing first, your product manager has come to you and they said, hey, look, we need a button component that can display text that can be specified in the parent component. So any text, I want that button to display it. So go ahead, think about how you might design that component. All right. Task two. Product manager comes back and they're like, well, actually, what we also need to do is we need to allow the button to be able to display an icon of our choice on the right side of the text. And go ahead and assume that there is an actual component such as app icon, as we see here below, that allows you to configure what kind of icon it is and that you can go ahead and put that inside of your code base. And go ahead and enhance your button with this new requirement. Okay, we're not done yet. Task three. They've come back and they like the icon on the right side, but now they want it to actually be able to be on both sides. But actually, now that I think about it, not just both sides, they want it to be on either side, meaning that it could be on the left, it could be on the right, it could be both, it could be none. That's for you to figure out. Let's go ahead and design that component inside of your head right now and enhance the button. Go ahead. All right, now you've got that done. Product manager still has even more requirements because after all, you think it's just a button, but gosh, it just keeps coming. And so now the question is, we want to make it possible to actually replace the content with a loading spinner, especially if it's making some sort of fetch to the back end. It goes and clicks and then swaps it in. And now assume we have this animated, basically pulse loader that is a component that you can see here on the bottom that you'll go ahead and put inside of your button component that will allow you to do said thing. So go ahead and just kind of scaffold that out in your head for your enhanced button component. All right. Finally, they say, you know what? That works in the majority of cases, but we also need this button to do something else because there are these other components where we would prefer the button to actually only replace the loading spinner on the right-hand side in the event is actually loading something. We don't want to replace all the text. We only want to replace the icon so that the user has some sort of context around the text that's going on. So go ahead and enhance your button. Okay. That's the end of the exercise. Hopefully you got like more or less a mental scaffold of what you would do. Here's one possible solution that some of you may have come up with. You probably started out here thinking, all right, cool, we have a button that needs to display some text. Let's, let's keep it simple. We got a button type button, has a class of nice button for the styles, and then we just, you know, it has a prop of text, boom, easy peasy. 
And then as your requirements gone on and on and on, well, hmm, it's gotten a little bit complicated. As we can see here, we have a series of template blocks, V, if, V, else. Depending on this conditional, we might display this. And gosh, what, what really started out as a simple button component now looks rather complicated to maintain and more importantly, kind of difficult to understand. And we haven't even really fully configured the logic on the bottom. That's just been simplified for the purposes of this experiment. And so, gosh, it just, when you look at that, it's like, oh, props everywhere. This GIF really does symbolize kind of this anti-pattern in the sense of what some people term like prop explosion pattern. Because when you start with something simple and you get a bunch of requirements, all of a sudden things have gotten super, super complicated. And so again, let's call this a prop based solution because after all, that's what we did. And so the question here really is, is it wrong? And even though I'm sort of leading us into like this concept of discussion around one of the reasons the prop solution isn't maybe quite so ideal, it's not that it's wrong, actually. It actually isn't wrong at all because what it does the job, right? If you were to ship this code to production and it's working for the users, product managers are happy, it's looking the way the designers want. I mean, you did your job, it works. But we're obviously not just here just to get across the finish line. We're really here to talk about scalability. And so, of course, the question is, is this good? Well, that's where the scalability and stuff comes in. And, and so this solution is not quite, I wouldn't call this good. And for some really specific reasons. First of all, as we saw, as you add new requirements, it just increases the complexity of how the component is actually being maintained. There's so many different responsibilities, a ton of different conditionals. And frankly, it gets pretty rigid, right? It's not very flexible because the moment you want to change something, you have to wade through this series of logic and conditionals just to figure out what's happening. And, you know, gosh forbid, like, what happens if you accidentally break the condition that breaks this other thing? Like, it feels like if you touch this one file, it could cause a lot of side effects in your code base. And that is a scary thing, especially when working on an enterprise code base. So ultimately, it becomes really hard to maintain. And so the question here is, is there a better alternative? And I'm a big fan of actually having a solution. We're going to present you a problem. I don't want to sit and just criticize something without giving you something different to choose. And the recommended solution here is actually to use slots which some of you may have come up with. And if so, bravo, nice job. Why might this be the recommended solution instead? Why slots? Well, the thing about slots here is that you have this ability to take what would be really complicated templates that you're front loading to like all these different conditionals with your props. And you're allowing it to simplify into a way that basically says, hey, look, here's the general wrapper for what you're trying to do. And then go ahead and configure it the way you think it needs to happen in this particular use case without mucking up and basically adding logic to a bunch of use cases that frankly don't apply to the instance of a button. And so if we just walk through a couple of examples here, we have here, you know, your app view, which is using your base button component. And, you know, you have your symbol submit button, fairly straightforward. And so from the base example, now we'll jump all the way to task five to see what it looks like in the slot based solution. And you can see here that the submit button really just had this additional two lines of code that basically says, hey, look, if it's loading, load the pulse floater. Otherwise, we're going to do the app icon. And just like that, you have this really specific scenario that can be used wherever you need it to on your application. But on the other hand, you haven't overcomplicated it when it comes to the rest of the logic for the other use cases that the button will most likely be used across the rest of the app. And so generally speaking, when we're thinking of slots, some use cases that to think about are things like content distribution, especially with things like layouts. Layouts are a great way to just sort of wrap some things and say, hey, look, here's the general layout and you do what you do. We're not going to like manage logic for you. And then especially if you're creating larger components where you're combining the smaller components or wrapping a bunch of things. I mean, at the end of the day, really, this is where this concept of composability comes into play. Because if we talk about composition, right, when you're assembling things together, that's what slots allow you to do really well is assemble things at the moment for the particular use case that you're doing. Whereas on the other hand, configuration is really almost like this switch and lever where you're trying to be like, well, if you switch this lever on, this thing will happen. And then if you press this button, but also do this lever, then this other thing will happen. And while that might be a lot of fun to configure at first, because, you know, it's fun, you know, creating these sort of complex wiring things. Ultimately, at the end of the day, one of the key principles when it comes to building scalable and reusable components is that they're easy to maintain by whoever is using them. And one of the tricky parts of prop heavy solutions is that you end up with a component that ultimately feels like you're reading like a dictionary or a user manual just to figure out how it works. 
And then even if it does work, you have to like usually add some sort of small edge case so that you can fit yours in there. And that's why on a lot of enterprise code bases, you'll see that a lot of developers that just end up opting out of these extremely complicated components, especially when they're prop heavy, it's because in their mind, they're like, I have this one use case. The code will be much easier to understand and maintain if I just put it in this different place. And that's how you ultimately end up with like 50 different buttons across the code bases. Because unfortunately, when we first started the original base button concept, it was too complicated and no one wanted to touch it anymore. And so as a general rule, when you're designing your components, especially if they're low level, like really base components, you really want to keep them flexible as much as humanly possible over the heavy configuration. And that's really the power of having composition over configuration. And again, the key thing I want to emphasize here is that it's not that composition always beats configuration. Configuration does have a level of being explicit and declarative in terms of what you expect the component to do. But again, it's about a balance of like, depending on the use cases. And more importantly, if you know that it's going to be something that's going to be used really widely, to be very careful about having generic components be heavy configuration rather than using composition. So pick and choose whatever makes sense when it comes to that. But now you know how to balance the trade-offs between configuration and composition.